Hi, everyone. Welcome to everyone joining us for today's talk. As Stephanie mentioned, I'm placed in the Vancouver Art Gallery, which is located on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil Nations in Vancouver, Canada. Today, I'm joined from Venice, Italy, by the artist Michael Craig Martin for this very special conversation. Now, before I introduce Michael, a few words of housekeeping. Please drop any question you might have during the talk into the Q&A, and we will hopefully have time to address a few towards the end of the talk. Uh, now, I'll briefly introduce Michael. Sir Michael Craig Martin is a leading figure of British conceptual art, probing the relationship between objects and images, harnessing the human capacity to imagine absent forms through symbols and pictures. In the 1990s, he made a decisive shift to painting, developing his hallmark style of precise, bold outlines, demarcating flat planes of intensely vibrant colors. He is famous as an artist, but also as a teacher, as a professor of fine art at Goldsmith College in London. Michael became a powerful influence on a generation of his students who would become known as the young British artists, including Sarah Lucas, Damien Hirst, and Gary Hume, among others. Alongside his incredible achievements as an artist and educator, in 2016, he was knighted in the Queen's Birthday Honours for his services to art. Welcome, Michael. Hi, Melissa. Nice to see you. Very nice to see you. So let's dive right in. We have a few slides of your work to complement the conversation today. Um, and I'd like to begin chatting about your early artwork and sculpture. Could you yes, tell us a little? We are going right back 1967. <laughs> yes, could you tell us a little bit about this image we see here? Well, uh, this is a work from the first group of works that I showed as an artist. They, it was shown in first in 1969. And I made a, a group of uh, works of sculptures that were based on box forms. And unlike, I saw minimalism as too abstract and too pure. And I wanted to make it more ordinary, more my sense of something being ordinary was very strong right from the beginning. So my boxes are literally boxes and they have hinges. Sometimes they have handles. In this one, I've made the box so it has two lids, but the, each lid is just slightly too big so that lids can never actually close. You close one, then you, the other one doesn't fit. So there's a, a sense of um, impossibility in it, but it's just plain with a very simple object, which is all which is normal to us, which is a box with hinges and lids. And that leads to my next question. Um, you've spoken before about function and how sculptures can engage the function of usefulness. So this is a box that never closes. So in a way, would you say that you are playing with the idea of function? I'm trying to, I'm trying to maintain the sense of functionality as far as I can. Although in a, one of the things that's interesting ab about art is the, in the sense that it is functionless and that it doesn't, it isn't required to perform function. But I, it, it struck me that uh, most use of found objects or real ob or things that you would describe as objects, for instance, uh, Duchamp's uh, ready-mades, uh, what's removed is their functionality. The bottle rack does not contain, uh, the you, don't have, you, you don't use to hold bottles. And the, the urinal, you certainly don't use the, uh, the fountain as, as it was as it was originally intended. So I thought, well, what if I tried to maintain that sense that a thing is being used as it, it as close to how it was intended as possible? Can we go to the next slide, please? Yes, this is a a, a table with four buckets of water. Uh, the water in the buckets and the buckets weigh exactly the same amount as the tabletop and they are suspended, the, the buckets are suspended from the ceiling by pulleys 
which go down to the tabletop. So we have what we have is that the objects on the table are supporting the table rather than the table supporting the objects. So it's this play between between ideas of functionality, but it's a table. So the things are on the table. There's, there's the buckets. They're supposed to be have water in. They have water in them. Everything is used as close as possible to how it would normally function. And yet there's a play with it that make that takes it away from that. And what's your interest in using everyday objects? Well, that's to be honest, that's very hard to explain. And it goes right back to my earliest thoughts about art. And the, there was something about the idea that that I, I found. I thought the, the 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 essence of things should be closer to us than we imagine, and that sometimes people look for the essence of things in things that are unusual and extreme. And I thought, really, the essence of things is right in front of our face. It's it's right here all the time, but it's very hard to recognize. And for me, ordinary objects, because they're imbued with so much meaning to us, because they're so familiar to us, because of their ubiquitousness, uh, that we, we kind of lose sight of them. And as one of the things that's interesting about art is as soon as you use something in a work of art, you elevate it. If you make a painting of something, you, you automatically have given it a certain kind of grandeur that the object might not orig or originally have. And so I, I'm, try I'm trying to bring that sense of importance to things. I mean, here in the, the milk bottles, there's shelf with milk bottles on it, but the shelf is tipped and the but the water in the milk bottles forms a horizon line. Um, but and I thought milk bottles were a wonderful object to use because they literally have no value at all. When you, in the days when you had milk deliveries, um, you didn't own the bottles, you didn't buy the bottles, you bought the milk. And you, the bottle, you put the bottle outside the door and the milkman gave you a new bottle. And so it's a literally valueless object turned into something that maybe appears to have value. This is so wonderful. I I was really captivated by this work and I've just noticed now, as you've explained the water level um, and how looking at the water level itself is almost like, you know, another work inside or looking at the horizon in a way. It just looking at the object in a very different way and noticing it in a different way. That's very much what I wanted was for the water to be like the ocean, that it was the horizon. That's the horizon line. In, in the work and uh, trying to get, get the water to continue right through the, the, the whole set, set of bottles. So I think um, moving on to your paintings, I think what we're doing now, ah, uh, I guess it's interesting. Do you see this as a painting? No. Um, no. It's a wall drawing, but in, I mean, but what happens to me in the, I mean, because the few things that we've looked at, there are dozens of works made at that period. It's the work I'm recovering um, 10 years of my career in three works. Uh, but but what, happened, what happened to me was that uh, having spent so long dealing with real objects, I, I got interested in the idea of images of objects instead of the objects. And I realized that most artists who use representational imagery take representation for granted and then use it. And I wanted to explore the nature of what two-dimensional imagery was, what, what it was like, how does it work, what's it, what's it do? And so I then started to make drawings of the kinds of objects that I'd previously used, the real object. And I made the drawings using a single line, always the same kind of line. I made it all in tape, so there's no personal inflection, it's not done with a pencil, and it's, there's no inflection in the line, because I wanted my drawings to have the character of the objects I was drawing. When, 
all these things are, man, are mass produced. Mass produced objects, when we get them, are perfect. We don't want, if we go to the supermarket and there's, a, there's a, something in the supermarket and it's damaged, we don't buy it. We want it to be perfect when we get it. And so I wanted my drawings to have that kind of natural perfection, uh, uh, which is in the, in the mass produced objects themselves. So that's why they had the character they did. And then I started to try to explore what could you do with, Im what did images allow that objects did not? And here's the first, one of the first things I did, 1978, uh, uh, the images can be transparent to each other. That's an, that in itself is a kind of amazing thing. And what's really extraordinary is if you look at the center of this, there's a kind of confusion of lines. But if you say uh, hammer, you can see the hammer perfectly. As soon as you focus on one, the other lines kind of drop away, don't they? They become part of a background. And it's amazing how easy it is for us to read something in what would apparently be a confusion. I thought all these aspects of, of two-dimensionality were really interesting. And how did you choose these particular three objects to be put together? Well, when I started to draw, I drew, in, in those days, I drew, the, I made the original drawing on uh, a, a piece of acetate using very thin tape, and it was always A4 size, like letter size. And um, my idea, uh, every, if I drew uh, 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 a sandal or a, or a piano, I drew it as big as I could on that sheet, size sheet of paper. So every image, as you can see, is more or less the same size. And what I wanted to do was to remove senses of hierarchy from things, big and small, expensive and cheap, useful and not so, you know, all these different things that we use to discriminate and to, to, to give hierarchies to things. So my idea was to treat each object, each image as though they, it was equal to the others. And so I tried to put together a set of images in which there is no narrative. I'm not, I'm not pursuing a narrative, but I am trying to, to, to play with it because the, because the objects are so identifiable, I don't ever want you to think, what is that? I want you to not even notice, you instantly recognize it and then you look at what it is that I'm presenting to you. Can we go to the next slide, please? Yes, following, this now we're into the 80s and I did a large series of works which are, which came from the, from the uh, drawings, but here, all the black lines that you see against the white wall are made of metal. Every time the line goes into the two panels, the red and the blue panel, uh, those are painted lines. So it's a mixture of a physical line and a painted and a painted line, but to, but they're given continuity through uh, from the from the one to the other. And so the, and the, the work stands three or four inches from the wall as a as a relief. Um, and I, I, what, I, what I was trying to do is something that I come to later, we'll come to it later, which is in a sense to physicalize drawing, to get the drawing to take on a kind of independent physicality rather than just existing on the surface of, a, of, of another. Here it's not actually on the surface, it's actually been lifted away from the wall, been lifted off the surface and has a kind of sculptural existence. I mean, I thought, I thought of all of these works, like the wall drawings, I thought of the wall drawings really as being sculpture and they came from my practice as a sculptor. I didn't come to this from a point of view of painter, as a painter, and you can see they're obviously not painterly in the sense that one normally means painterly, but, but I'm, I'm basically a constructor. I put things together as an artist. And I think of um, uh, these things as, uh, uh, as, in a sense, as uh, sculptures that are um, uh, without mass. They are presence without mass. Oh, thank you. Yes. I was just going to say, I think that you've succeeded there. Um, if we can just quickly go back 
a little. Um, it really looks like a two dimensional object placed on top of a three dimensional object. And it's, it's I think playing with your per the perception in such a way um, that is very interesting. I, th I, I think it's very important that uh, um, everything, so much of our world, our understanding of the world has to do with our ability, our amazing ability to read two dimensional images. If we couldn't be doing this right now, if we couldn't read two dimensional images, the reason your dog isn't home watching TV while you're out is because they don't read two dimensional images. And this is a staggering ability. And to me, the, if you go back to all early languages, you go back to hieroglyphics, you go back to early Chinese writing, it all starts with pictograms. It starts with pictures. It starts with images of things, which then become abstracted into what we know of as language, a verbal language. But it starts with images. So the basis of all of our ability to communicate really comes through our ability to understand that here we have a picture of trousers and there are no trousers. There are no trousers, it's a picture. But we have the sense of the presence of the trousers which are not present. And that gives us incredible abstract freedom for the imagination because we can move through things that are not uh, an understanding of things which you don't have to have in place. Can we go to the next slide? Yes, we're making a very big jump here. <laughs> <laughs> but this get, but does give you this give you a sense of what what happened from the the, the 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 trousers, the French trousers. Of course, they were called French trousers because it was red, yellow, and blue, red, white, and blue. Um, but um, uh, uh, in the um, uh, 90s, um, I started to make installations, giant installations filling whole museums. Uh, and I started to use uh, colored walls, painted rooms with images in them. And uh, from, and what happened was as the, the decade went on towards the second half of the decade, I started to, try, I started to turn to paintings I, up to that point. I, until it was the mid nineties, I didn't make any paintings. I did very few paint, I did a few paintings, but I was trying to play with it, but I couldn't find, I couldn't find a way to make paintings. And then uh, towards, the, uh, towards the mid nineties, I started to find a way in which I felt I could make paintings. And the, the paintings start as uh, single images of single objects. And for me, this is, you know, in a way, it's like the essence of what I do, which is you look, there is one thing and there's one painting. I don't make headphones, I make paintings of headphones. And so there's the object that I'm picturing, which is the headphones, and there's the object I make, which is the painting, and I'm trying to bring the two together as closely as possible. And I think that's a very unique distinction. And I think it's really important to understand the, the kind of very interesting difference that you're trying to do here with that distinction. Uh, can we go over to the next slide? I think we'll be going back to this idea of headphones later when we look at your public artwork. Uh, but perhaps we could talk a little bit about uh, the objects here and knowing. Yes, we, I mean, here there's a, a painting where, where there's a, a, a number of objects. You see, you, you have to remember that each object I draw, I've drawn individually. So each object is containing its own perspective because I didn't draw the, I didn't, I didn't this never existed as, a, as something I drew. I drew each one separately and then put them together in this way. And what I've done here is I'm kind of mimicking perspective. So I have the bigger objects, the bigger objects, which are actually the smallest objects are at the front. The mid-sized objects are in the middle and the, the, the biggest objects, because they're the furthest away become small, but actually we don't know whether, you know, maybe it's just a very small ladder. 
and a very big globe. There's, it's, only, it's only us that's filling in this idea that this is a perspectival space. And, and again, these are, these are the questions at the essence of how we read images, we, that we do this very complex thing of understanding. And you know, I, I, I always think too, when I, if I give you images here, you know, like uh, the flashlight, uh, everybody knows that it's a flashlight, but I haven't told you it's a flashlight. I have, you can't see the bulb, uh, it's not on. Uh, you don't know how big it is. I'm not telling you how big it is. I'm not telling you what it's made of. I'm not telling you what it's for. And yet, you look at that and you know all of those things. I don't have. I don't give you any of this information. I give you an amazingly minimal amount of information with an image, and the audience fills in all the things that we need to that you need to know in order to understand what you're looking at. It's quite extraordinary how we do this. Sorry, just I have a quick question just going back. I wanted to ask about your use of color here, um, just because it's it's quite unconventional for an object that we immediately associate with here. So, for example, we associate fire extinguishers being red and um, and even the use of brown for the metronome uh, is the I don't know what that's called the ticker part of the metronome is kind of camouflaged into the brown as well as the stool. So I'd like to ask you how you choose your sense of color. Well, what, ha what happened to me in the, it goes back again to the installations. I, I did an installation. Uh, I had never used color before. And then I had the opportunity to do an installation in a gallery in Paris. And there were, there were a set of seven rooms and I had this idea that I would paint each room a different color and I would paint on the wall two images, this kind of image, but painted directly on the wall. And so I thought, well, seven colors, for each, one for each room, what color should they be? And I thought, well, there, there, are, you know, there, there aren't many more than seven colors. What are there? There's red, yellow, blue, just like these objects which you can, which you can name. I, you, every object I draw, you can name. What are the named colors? red, yellow, blue, pink, green. So I painted each room one of those colors and I made each room as forcefully that color as possible. And when I saw it, I realized that I had liberated myself in terms of color because the colors were so intense and had such a passion in relation to each other and I, it made me realize eventually that I could use these colors in the objects as well as behind the objects. And that whereas my, I draw everything 100% accurately as I can. I never distort anything. I draw things as close to a, a picture that you read that exactly as we experience it. But when it comes to the color, I allow myself total freedom. Anything can be any color. I can make it, if I want to make it yellow, I make it yellow. If I don't, I make it green instead. I can make it pink. As soon as you uh, uh, allow yourself this kind of liberation, the, the, the combination of the liberation of the color with the uh, austerity of the drawing uh, seems to me to be, to give the work a, a very different kind of dynamic than it had in the beginning because you're getting this play between the passion of the color and the intensity of it and the absurdity of it. But it also gives a sense of, of specificness and life to these objects, which are drawn in this very precise way. Absolutely, and it's such a wonderful way to put it, this liberation of color. Um, could we go to the next slide? I think the next slide is about fragments. Perhaps you could uh, chat a little bit about how we've gone in a different direction here. Well, again, uh, you know, I, uh, it's a, uh, I have this career of, of exploring what is the world of, two, of the two-dimensional two image. And part of what, uh, of course, if, uh, what two dimensions allow, as we've already seen, is I can, uh, I can, I can draw something much bigger than the real thing. 
or I can draw something, I can make a ladder and make it tiny, or I can make a safety pin and make it gigantic. So, because images allow that, the objects have a size, but the images have a freedom that the, that the objects don't have. And so in this exploration, uh, eventually I have done work where the, the, you only see part of the object rather than the whole of the object. And that's interesting too, because I don't even need to give you the whole object for you to know what they are. You can fill in the bit I haven't, I haven't given you, and, but it also allows the object to take on a scale that is larger than the format in which it's been presented. And so I really find this very interesting because, you know, if you go back to the boxes, the boxes were about trying to make overt the sense that the audience completes the object. If you have a box that somebody's supposed to open and close, you're doing exactly what you're not supposed to do with sculpture. You're not supposed to touch it. But my boxes, if you didn't touch them, they don't work. And so I'm trying to say that in two-dimensional imagery, which we often think makes us passive, we're not being passive at all. We're, the audience is very active in the creation of the, of the thing that's understood, the thing that's seen. I find that really fascinating. I think because there's a kind of immediate engagement that you seem to be thinking about with the audience and thinking about how the brain works in filling in the blanks. Um, the other thing I think that's so interesting about um, these paintings that are fragments is that it's really kind of playing around with the idea of where the painting ends. The object is, our brain has to finish the object of the coat hanger, but at the same time, it's, it's also kind of playing around with the idea of the finished of where the painting finishes and it maybe it's it's past the canvas yes i love i love the idea that something extends into the space beyond and that uh so you can have uh you, you know if you go back to the one just before this you go back to this the the court yes you see i mean there's a it's a most of the object is not here there's handles and there's the bit there on the top the, you know it's a it's a quite a large object uh and we have a tiny bit of it but it's absolutely clear what it is you know immediately what it's for and you just fill in the bit that i that i don't give you and its function is very very clear and one of the things that's interesting about ordinary objects. Um, all the things I draw are objects of use. Nobody makes an object of use without there being a use. If there wasn't a use, people don't, you wouldn't make it. People designed a hammer in order to, not nails into it, people made corkscrews in order to get corks out. That's why, that's, and the reason it takes the form it does, the material it does, is in order to perform that function. This is a very important thing about why things look the way they do, why they're at the scale that they are, why they have the materiality that they do. All these questions come into the, this question of functionality, but also the images have functions. And I'm very interested in the idea that images are used in signage, that images are used in advertising, that images are used as we are now. You and I are looking at each other, with, thousands and thousands of miles apart and we're we're together here in, through imagery it's imagery that's making us possible to be here together it's really fascinating could we move to the next oh great so we're back in a way at the headphones again and we first looked at headphones in a painting and now could you tell us a little bit more about the headphones here well, if, if we go right back, you know, we go back to the, the, the French trousers where I had the, the, the metal drawing that was in Leaf Held from the Wall. Um, uh, one of, I thought about uh, trying to make sculptures of drawings for years, but of course, as drawings are flat, it's very difficult to figure out how to make them stand up. It's a very simple physical thing. How do you get them to support themselves? And what I, realized really, you know, about 15 years ago, 10, 15 years ago, was that if I buried the support under the ground, 
you could make an, a drawing appear to just stand on edge. So here we have the, this is a drawing in metal of the headphones and uh, the, 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 the support of the drawing has been set into the concrete floor. You don't see any support at all. And it just appears to be uh, floating there. But the thing that's important about it is unlike most, most sculptures imitate the form of the object being represented. This, if you, my, whereas my, my sculptures are the, the way in which you read the image is entirely two dimensional. This is a pictorial way of reading. If you walk around the sculpture, it becomes a single line, one inch wide. It has no depth, these drawings. They are completely flat, but you read it as three dimensional because you read it. Uh, 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 you read it two, you read it as a two-dimensional image. I mean, this this is the same sculpture that we, uh, which is in the previous uh, slide. That in the previous slide, it was in the neutrality of the gallery. Here we have it in Hong Kong in this elaborately complex space. In the elaborately complex space, um, uh, where it's its transparency is very, very much more obvious that you suddenly realize that all the movement going on in, behind it, all the way you move past it, it's constantly engaging with whatever, with its, with, uh, its environment. And it, uh, it makes this engagement in a very unusual way because, uh, it, 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 because of its transparency. You've mentioned before about in a way about a two-dimensional object in a three-dimensional space. Um, and is that what you're referring to here? Yes, I've tried to take, I've tried to turn a, uh, a two-dimensional drawing into, a, a th in a sense, a three-dimensional object, a, sc a sculpture, but it's, it's not a sculpture of a headphones, it's a sculpture of a drawing of a headphone. And um, I think it's the thing that makes them uh, obviously it makes them unusual is that uh, because of this uh, uh, dependence on two dimensionality, whereas the obvious way to understand sculpture is to understand it in three dimensional terms. Mine are minimally three dimensional. Can we go to the next? Right. So this is also in Hong Kong, I see as well. So all of the sculptures here or the sculptural drawings, um, they're all placed in the same space. Is that correct? Yes, there's, there's, there's three drawings in Hong Kong. There's the high heel shoe, there's the headphones, and there's a light bulb. You can just see the, the light bulb at the top of the screen. And you can also get a sense that if you kept moving around, it would become a single yellow line. And it's actually, I mean, it's quite fitting in a way that it's a high-heeled shoe as this is one of the major shopping malls in Hong Kong. Um, and so it's, it's just a quite an interesting context to have people shopping for high-heeled shoes and then looking down and seeing a kind of three-dimensional drawing of high-heeled shoes. Yes, I, ne I, never uh, uh, I never think of my work in terms of uh, advertising. I'm not trying to advertise uh, shoes, but and, and I'm not particularly interested in the idea which has been explored by many artists about um, the you know the uh, commercial values of things and uh, uh, the, the question of the economics of these things. It's much more the uh, the literal object, the simple object, the object in a sense contextless. Put it into the shopping mall suddenly gives it a context, and of course it takes a different context here. I've shown it before out in the countryside. You put this high heel in the countryside. Now we have a different kind of story. Don't you? Don't have the shopping story. You've got a different kind of story, and so uh, just like the transparency allows them to uh, absorb their surroundings. Uh, the, the, the nature of the surroundings also impacts how one understands the object one's looking at. 
Do we have the slide of the shoe in the countryside? Ooh, we don't have it. Okay. Um, but it's, it's really, I think what you're doing is really fascinating because it really requires the participation of the audience in a way and the audience's brain to think of the image in a particular way. And it's, and I think when one thinks about going to the mall and there's a particular shoe in one's brain that one wants to go and see, perhaps go and buy or not, it's, it's, it's again playing around with the idea of images in one's brain and then how one can take, can look at a particular two-dimensional image and change kind of the feeling of that as well. Sorry, I don't think I'm making much sense there, <laughs> but. But I, think, I, I, but I do, I think, you're, I think you're, and I think it's very important too that, um, you see, when, when I was saying about how one understands a lot of things about images uh, from, uh, I give you a very simple image, but you understand all sorts of complex things about the object I've depicted. Uh, that's, that's all to do with memory. And images work through memory. The reason I give you things you can name, and I don't want you to speculate and think, what is this, is because I want to call upon your memory. And we don't realize how rich our memories are because, we don't, because it's so unconscious, we don't look at a hammer and think, oh, this is what we're for. You don't have to, you just know. And so, but the, but the role of memory and how we understand the world is incredibly important. And without, without our ability to store visual imagery in the way that we do in memory, we wouldn't be able to operate in the world as we do. And one of the things, you know, when, when I was a kid, we used to think that the vision worked by you looked at something and then the retina turned it upside down and the brain turned it right side up. But the, but the eyes were like a mirror reflect of take, just taking in the world. Well, today, scientists understand that vision works entirely different. It doesn't work like that at all. Uh, we, we're only really seeing the part of the, our vision that we're focused on. And our brains through memory fill in all the peripheral vision. And that's why, we, that's why we're able to uh, operate in the world. If we had to take in everything, we'd all go nuts. We don't have to do that. We only have to think about, we only have to focus on the thing we're focused on. And then the brain does the rest. So it's a, it's a combination of sight and intellect, sight and intellect. Everything we do is to, to do with this combination. And I think that the, the, we see this played out clearly through two dimensional images. It, it mirrors what happens in normal sight. So just on that subject, we, we have a couple of questions from the audience, particularly about your work in imagery. So I might maybe move there. Uh, we have a question. Well, here's a question um, on color from Michael Chan. What was the inspiration behind the bright color schemes in your work? Well, essentially, my, uh, you know, for most of my career, to be honest, I was kind of frightened of color and I couldn't figure out, I couldn't try to figure out a way to, how does one properly, how could I properly use color? And because how do I find a reason for using one color and another? And it was when I realized that it didn't matter. That was the thing that was the key, was it didn't matter if it was green or pink. If you're not trying to make it the natural color, it's, a, it's one of the liberations of picture making that you're allowed to make it. The people who understand this perfectly, as everybody knows, are small children. No small child ever picked up a purple crayon and drew a picture of a house and thought, I'm drawing a purple house. They don't think about that. They take the first thing at hand and they're perfectly happy to make it purple or yellow or pink. It doesn't make any difference. 
They use the things, their, their, their instinct to it is so immediate. They don't, they're not thinking about that. And very often, children often have a very strong reaction to what I do because they know that I'm quite close to what they do, how they are perceiving things. Because it's very simple, things are very simple. I have these images and I color them in. That's what kids do. That was a question I had actually in the back of my mind, how children would view your work, um, just because it's often, it's this use of your brain as an adult filling in what's there. And so a children with lesser experience, how one would approach your work. Well, I, what I've, what, uh, I have a lot of fan mail from, from young children. And I also, uh, I also hear a lot from uh, teachers of young children who show my work to students, to kids. And the thing that, they, that, that the teachers find useful is because it's, it's, not, it's not because I legitimize the sense of color because kids already, they already know that. But, but, I, but it's the thing of showing them that they can, they, to uh, encourage them to draw the things that are around them, the things that are familiar to them, that they don't have to look for something special. They don't have to look for something that comes from another life or somebody else's world. The things directly, the things in their hand, the things they do use every day, draw those things. And they, kids get that immediately. So I think on the subject of education, we have another question uh, from the audience. In the late 1980s, Goldsmiths played an important role in the development of the young British artists. What had changed in education what has changed in education in more recent years to make universities less influential? So here's a presumption that universities are less influential. Do you agree? <laughs> uh, yes, I, well, I'm not sure about influential, but uh, I think, I mean, I can only speak for really my own experience. My own experience of teaching was in Britain. It was through the 70s, from the 70s, you know, from the 60s into the 90s. Um, the, the period from the 60s to the early 90s in Britain was a picture, it was a time of incredible academic liberalism. And as a teacher, you were given enormous uh, respect and authority about what you did. I had a kind of academic freedom that nobody teaching today has. And so I was able to do exactly what I thought was best. And I was able, as I discovered new things, I was able to adjust my teaching practice to uh, adapt to what it was that was happening. I was learning all the time from what I, what, what I was seeing, what the students were doing. Um, and what's happened in education since the 90s, and I think it's happened right across the world, is it's become more restrictive, it's more rule-based, it's more, it's to do with things that are measurable. Everything that's creative is resistant to these things. This, it is, you know, it's, it's to me, it's, uh, it's kind of anti-creative because art is really, to me, art is really only at its most interesting when it's doing something that other things don't do. If you can do something in a, without doing art, that's the proper way to do it. Art is interesting because it, uh, it's, a, it's the area of human activity that just like it's, it can be functionalist, it can be wayward, it, it, it can take chances, it can, do, it can do all sorts of things because it's essentially observational towards the world. It's looking at what other people are doing, looking at what the world is like and filtering it through a kind of through a personal experience. And this is, uh, seems to me, that is very, very, you can't regulate that. And a lot of the way education has gone is that it's created regulation. The trouble is, as soon as you have regulations, you, instead of raising standards, you lower them. And that kind of moves on into me wanting to ask you a little bit about the book you wrote um, entitled On Being an Artist. Uh, you've mentioned before in an interview that a lot of the thoughts from the book came out of the desire to speak more clearly to students about art making. Uh, 
Would you, do you think teaching has clarified or contributed to your own art practice? Sure, I think, uh, you know, I, um, uh, I found when I was teaching, you know, I think probably anybody teaching is, uh, is thinking about who are my favorite teachers? Who are the teachers who really helped me? What did I hate about my own education? What was useless? And what did I, what was, what made me miserable? And you want to try to figure out how, I, I, I wanted to figure out how to be useful. And I wanted to figure out how to be able to say to students the kind of thing that I wanted somebody to say to me that I often didn't hear. I wanted a certain kind of advice. I didn't want to be told what to do, but I wanted a certain kind. So I, my, my approach to teaching was to try to figure out how, you know, how can you be useful here? And um, I, of, I often found that in talking to students, I needed to listen to myself because very often what I was saying to them was something I needed to hear myself but I found it hard to address it directly to myself. But when I was telling them, if I listened in, I could turn it into something useful to me too. I guess I'm thinking also a lot about liberation. Um, and in a way, it's kind of an overall theme, how you talked about liberation of color, and then in a way, a liberation for students or artists uh, to do what they want, so liberation from rules, liberation from structures, in a way also. Uh, we're almost out of time, and maybe the last question I could ask you is perhaps about the artwork you have behind you, because we've been looking at it this whole time. I wonder. I can't oh, it's a big painting behind me. And, um, uh, it, it, you know, uh, I, I didn't always uh, like to live with my own work, uh, but uh, sometimes it's nice to have it around. And I have to say, to be honest, at my age, as I get older, I find I'm, I'm more interested in what I do than what anybody else does. And, um, I, you know, there was, all those years of teaching gave me an interest in lots of other people's work. Um, uh, I don't do that so much anymore. <laughs> Many thanks to everyone for joining us today. Um, and for those of, us, those of you who submitted questions and huge thanks again, Michael, for giving up your time on Saturday. Uh, and I wish you all a wonderful rest of the weekend. Do you have any parting words you wanted to say at all, Michael? Well, just to thank everybody who's listening, and I hope that it's been entertaining. Thank you very much, Mr. for our conversation, and I hope it's been enjoyable for other people. Thank you again. Enjoy the rest of the weekend, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.